Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Soon, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we've solved all of our problems, including finding the speaker and finding the presentation, and then getting it all to work technically, which is pretty impressive. I, so I'm, I'm very pleased that Professor Kay could be with us today. Um, he's currently attached to the London School of Economics. Um, of course, he could go probably anywhere in the world and have any university very pleased uh, for him to join them. So we're very lucky that uh, we got to chat with him a little bit this afternoon while he's spending some time on the west coast of the United States. Um, there's a million things that I could tell you about Professor K. He was the dean of, well, is it the word, do you use the word dean when you yes, talk you about? Do. Okay. Right, imitatively, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the Said Business School at Oxford. Um, he's written a fascinating new work uh, called Culture and Prosperity, The Truth About Markets. Of course, the book has different titles depending on which country you buy it in. I think the content should all be fairly similar. Um, very excited that you're able to join us this afternoon. Please help me welcome Professor John Kay. You might think the book has different titles for different markets because we're price discriminating across different markets, something with which you're all, I'm sure, familiar. Um, but although we are price discriminating across different markets, that's not the primary reason. The primary reason is that we published it in the UK under the title The Truth About Markets. And we had some problem there with getting the, the, the book was shelved by booksellers along with things about how to become rich by day trading and so on. And we realized that that would be an even more acute problem if we brought the same title to the United States. Because the markets which I talk about in this book, although I do talk about securities markets, are not primarily securities markets. And it kind of rather irritates me that the term the markets has come into to popular usage to describe what is actually a rather small part of the market economy. And what I do in the book is to talk about many other kinds of markets. So I talk about the market for flowers, the market for electricity, the market for milk, and the market for oil. But the, one of the purposes of the book is to explain how a market economy actually functions and why it's made about 20 countries in the world rich, about 20 countries divided roughly between Western Europe and America with a few scattered elsewhere in the world, about 20 countries with 800 million people of population rich while the 5 billion people who live in the other 170, 180 states of the world remain poor. So my first objective was actually to describe how a market economy works. But my second objective, you know, was to say that in the last few years, we've had an oversimplified description of how it is that market economies do work with consequences that have been immensely damaging for the functioning of the real market economy. I'm by profession what I call a business economist. That is, I'm an economist, but I'm not the kind of economist who most people, I find, believe economists are. If I, if I tell people at a dinner party I'm an economist, you know, they will turn to me without very much interest and say, so what do you think is going to happen to interest rates? And uh, look round to see if there's someone more interesting round the table to talk to. I want to say right at the beginning that I am not that kind of economist. What Paul Krugman has called an up and down economist who says inflation is going up and interest rates are going down. I'm interested in the kind of subjects, the way in which markets operate that I've described. And actually I don't think there could have been a more fascinating time than the last 15 years or so to have been an economist with these kind of interests. 
Let me just remind you, if our technology works, and if it doesn't work here, I don't know where it will work. Let me just remind you of some of the events that have happened during that period. Perhaps it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. I've got it. It won't work on the mouse. Ah, perfect. some sound for this but you can't have everything and I don't plan to sing for you to mess it up. of the Berlin Wall in 1989 brought to an end one of the very few controlled experiments it's ever been possible to have in social science. You know, we divided Germany at the end of the Second World War into two zones. One of them run as a decentralized market economy. The other one, uh, the other one run as a centralized planned society. And after 15 years, we actually had to build a wall, or they had to build a wall between the two parts of the experiment to stop the citizens of one zone fleeing to the other. And 25 years after that, the citizens of both zones together joyfully tore down the wall. As I say, it's an unusual to have a controlled experiment on that scale. The result was also extremely decisive. And the result was actually very surprising in some senses. Because if you go back to the 1960s, people believed that centrally planned economies and the societies of which they were part might be morally inferior to the kind of societies we had in the West. But people had not then appreciated the extent to which they would be inferior in terms of their economic performance. This was the era of the Sputnik and various other apparent Soviet achievements. When people were frightened, both people on the right and the left were frightened of the potential of Soviet technology. And no, very few people then understood quite how poorly 
the Russian economy was doing, or ultimately that it would be economic failure rather than moral and political failure that would bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union. But that is in fact what happened. And what I want to argue today is that America won the Cold War in rather decisive and spectacular fashion. But that in misunderstanding the nature of the victory which occurred in the Cold War, it actually has jeopardized quite a lot of that particular success. And that that lies behind quite a lot of both the economic and the political problems we have today in the world. So what I want to do today is to mount something of an attack on what Francis Fukuyama called the end of history. The idea that basically a combination of lightly regulated capitalism and liberal democracy, which bore a remarkable resemblance to the United States in the last decade of the 20th century, that that combination of lightly regulated capitalism and liberal democracy was right not just for the United States at that particular moment in time, but represented the end of history, that it, is, it was a doctrine of universal validity to which all other societies must be in some kind of transition. What has happened in this odd way in the last 10 years has been that the kind of claims of economic determinism and historic inevitability which used to be made by people on the political left are today made by people on the political right. And the epitome of that kind of world view, I think, is what I describe in the book as the American business model, which is a story that says that how market economies work is basically simple. And you can not only have a manual, but actually really quite a thin manual that can be handed to people in Russia or Iraq to tell them how to make that market economy work. What I can't do is open the curtains Oh, yes, I can. To let you have uh, the rest of the presentation. What I call the American business model rests, in the way I characterize it in the book, on four basic propositions. The first, which those of you who read economics will recognize as the caricature of rational economic man, is the story that self-regarding materialism is the dominant human motivation at any rate, as far as economic and business matters are concerned. The second is a kind of market fundamentalism, that restrictions on the operation of free markets are costly and ought as far as possible to be minimized. The third is the minimal state, that the economic role of the state should not extend very much beyond the protection and of private property rights and the enforcement of the contracts which individuals make. And the final is low taxation, that taxation should be, I don't know why people keep laughing, um, taxation should be limited to what is necessary to perform these functions and to support a basic welfare safety net. So low taxation, minimal state, market fundamentalism, and rational economic man. These are the four precepts of what I call the American business model. And I've talked about this sometimes in Europe. People have said to me, but you're talking about a caricature. No one really believes that. But I tell them, just open the Wall Street Journal every day, any day, and you will see that particular worldview being expressed. So that's what I call the American business model. And what I devote part of the book to doing is to explaining the case for this position, why it is that people believe market economies can be described in this way, and another part for taking that case apart. If I can simply demonstrate some of the flaws which arise in that particular case. The first flaw is that self-regarding materialism, although it's undoubtedly a human motivation, and one could not have lived through the last 10 years and not believe that there were a lot of people who behave in that kind of way, is not an overriding motivation, and it's actually typically not the motivation of people who, um, uh, of people who build successful businesses. I spent a long time ago, in um, uh, a little time, 
uh, looking for the epitome of rational economic man. I looked for some of the 19th century US robber barons, people like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, to find that uh, Carnegie famously said, the man who dies rich dies disgraced, and gave away a pretty substantial part of his fortune before he died, but Rockefeller, who did the same, was perhaps he was a humbug, perhaps not, I don't know. But he described his ability to make money as a gift which had been given to him by God, and one which he uh, was obliged by his religious convictions to get up each morning to exercise to the maximum possible extent. <laughs> I thought I would uh, uh, find rational economic man by looking for the autobiography of Donald Trump, it was actually out of print when I started this particular quest, although I noticed in the bookshops since I've been over in the US that it's actually come back into print. Even though it's back in print, I don't particularly recommend you buy it. In fact, I don't recommend you buy it at all. But on the very first page, the very first words of Trump's autobiography are, I don't do it for the money. I've got more money than I could ever need. I do it to do it, he says. Uh, deals are my art form. And then there's poor old Warren Buffett, the second richest man in the United States, who as some of you may know still lives in the same bungalow in Omaha that he bought back in 1956 when he had a good deal less money than he has now, and who still has as a favorite night out an evening at the Nebraskan Steakhouse he's been patronizing for that time, washed down with his favorite tipple of a jar of cherry or right of a glass of cherry coke. It's not that I want money, says Warren. It's the fun of making money and of watching it grow. Um, I also did a little bit of research on Bill Gates in relation to all of this. I won't necessarily report all of the, all, all of the results of that, but I think you will all recognize that the fundamental motivations are to do with building businesses and with information technology, and that the money is in a very real sense secondary to that. And that is actually true for all the people we're talking about. Most of them are interested to some degree in money, but actually the activity of building up a business is actually hard and demanding work. And the people who are most successful at it have throughout the decades proved to be not the people who are most interested in money, but the people who are most profoundly interested in business and committed to business. So that self-regarding materialism, although it is an economic motivation, is not an overriding economic motivation, and it's not actually the most important motivation in creating ongoing successful businesses. And I suggest, by saying in the last decade or two that greed was good, that self-regarding materialism is not only a legitimate economic motivation, but the driving motivation of the capitalist system, we have attracted into positions in finance and business, people for whom it is the overriding motivation, people who are in fact typically sociopathic in their devotion towards, uh, towards making money, who are not actually the people we either want, we can either expect to create successful new businesses, or the people we want to have running established ones. So the first group of issues are to do with the failure of self-regarding materialism to be, an appropriate, uh, to be an appropriate overriding economic motivation. Second group of problems I talk about are ones which are to do with uh, what I call, info, what economists call information asymmetry. And if you want to understand how information asymmetry creates problems for a market economy, you might think of a problem which has been um, uh, posed by a number of economists that runs something like this. Here's my wallet, and I'm ready to auction it to people in this room. And you might think, how much money would you expect me to have in my wallet? Fifty to a hundred dollars, perhaps. That's what people typically might hold. 
So some of you will think perhaps he's got $50 in the wallet, we'll bid $50. Others, you might go a bit higher, $80 perhaps. Some of you, relatively restrained, come up with lower, uh, with lower estimates. Suppose, there is, suppose we have these variety of bids, and there is, in fact, $50. I'm afraid I've made it £50 for purposes of this. All right. Suppose there is £50 in my wallet. Then what will happen, of course, is that I won't be very interested in the £50 bid. I rather like the £80 bid. I don't mind what the £10 bid, and I'll be very happy about the £100 bid. In other words, if you bid 80 or 100 pounds, you will get my wallet. If you bid 10 or 50 pounds, you won't. The basic feature of this kind of transaction, of this sort of game, is that there is no price which it is, willy, which it is sensible for you to offer, which it is also sensible for me to accept. That is, there is no terms on which this exchange, in the face of asymmetric information, I know more about what it is I'm selling than you know about, about what it is I'm buying. There is no terms on which that particular set of transactions make sense. Now, you may think we're talking about a rather artificial example in this, and we are. But you should notice two things. First of all, that almost all the things we buy and sell in modern economies have this characteristic of asymmetric information about them. There isn't equality of information between buyer and seller. And the second is to see that what is characterized by the wallet auction is not very different from a lot of trade that actually happens in securities markets and financial markets. And indeed there are quite a lot of people around who might be rather better off than they are now if they'd ask themselves the simple question that the wallet auction invites you to think about, which is the question, why should I buy something that this guy out there wants to sell? And one of the standard reasons for answering that question is that the guy who's selling it knows more about the characteristics of what is being sold than, um, uh, than the person who's buying it. And that takes one directly into the role of markets in risk and securities markets and the way in which they function in a modern society. I used to teach uh, finance theory to undergraduate and graduate classes in Oxford and other universities. And when I did so, I told them about the economic role of securities markets and how markets for risk actually functioned. I explained that what was happening in risk markets was that people who found two risks too large for themselves to bear themselves were able to spread these risks over other people and the result of trading in risks in this kind of way was that the overall costs of bearing risk in a modern economy were reduced through trade in risk markets. That's the story I used to teach and it's the story that a lot of my colleagues still teach and those of you who have done classes in finance theory will have been exposed to that kind of view of the world. It's not a view which I hold anymore. And there are, I can describe two moments in my life which really brought it home to me that this was not how this particular, uh, how these markets worked. One was I became involved in the Lloyds, in the reforming the Lloyds insurance market in London after it came near to collapse at the end of the 1980s. And basically the group of events that brought it close to collapse were the growth of reinsurance contracts within the market. They were contracts of the kind where people would underwrite a certain volume of risks and then someone else would agree to underwrite the risk that the total volume of claims, either against an individual or against a group of underwriters, exceeded a certain amount. Uh, so there were these layers of insurance and reinsurance. And that worked fine for a bit. These claims were not very large and no one had to pay out of these policies. Then in the late 1980s, there were a series of, of disasters. The one that started the process off was... Um, was one that uh, was, the, was when our North Sea oil rig called Piper Alpha went on fire and at that time that was one of the largest claims which had ever been made in the world insurance market.
And what happened was that this triggered a range of claims against Lloyd's underwriters. When these claims were met, that took a lot of the syndicates at Lloyd's to the limit of their reinsurance, so that the, the, the reinsurance cover started to come in. But of course what that then did was to trigger claims against the syndicates who had risen, written the reinsurance. And the result was that that triggered still more and more claims. The claims in fact cascaded round the market until an initial one billion dollars of claims turned out to generate total claims within the market of 16 billion dollars. And what also emerged was that the people who had written these excessive loss policies had actually, without knowing it, ensured the same risk over and over again, because all the policies they'd written turn out to replace for that particular risk. So what had happened in Lloyd's was that an old system by which people shared risks across the market, the way Lloyd's used to work, was that you walked into Lloyd's, the Lloyd's market, with a particular risk, and a lead underwriter, someone respected in the market, would say, I'll take 10% of that risk at a particular price, and given that lead, a lot of other people in the market would follow him and pick up 5% and 2%, and so on, till you got to 100. What had happened instead was that people were trading these risks with each other. That was how the total volume of claims so much exceeded the initial volume. And the memorable moment for me when I asked when, was when I talked to a group of underwriters who were denouncing the incompetence of their colleagues who had written a lot of their policies and asked them why they hadn't done anything to blow the whistle on the stupidity of these people. And their answer was, their answer was, that these people were taking risks off me at a price at which I was very willing to sell it. What, in, what was happening then in that market was not, as my conventional model said, that people for whom it was expensive to bear risk uh, passed it on to people who would bought, bought, uh, bear it more cheaply. In fact, what happened you know, was the world's oil companies who can perfectly well bear a several, several billion pound claim, you know, without severe damage to their balance sheets, had actually passed on the risk to a group of rather silly, rich, aristocratic English people who had no idea of the nature of the activity with which they got involved. And I came to see that what I'd seen in Lloyd's was actually a microcosm of what has been happening in the financial system as a whole. That a process of sharing risks has been transformed into a process of trading risks, and the essence of that process of trading risks is one, is one in which people who know quite a lot about what it is they're buying, that they're selling, pass it on to people who know rather less about what they're buying. So that asymmetric information, far from being exceptional, actually drives quite a lot of what happens in securities markets. Well, this is the, is the slide I got when I asked my research assistant to download a picture of a casino. And when, when, she, when she gave it to me, I said, that's not a casino, that's a picture of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, which it does indeed look rather like. And when last week I did an interview in front of a screen that represented the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I thought that is exactly, you know, what it looks like. This is not actually a coincidence that the dominant driving force of a lot of activity in modern securities markets is that people sell risks to other people who know less about them. And when I taught that finance theory, I used to tell people the reason it's got to be like that is that if people don't behave rationally in risk markets, people who behave irrationally will lose money to people who behave more rationally. I still believe that, but I now think that is exactly what is going on in a large part of financial services activity. The reason for downloading the casino for photograph was actually another event which brought home to me the importance of that. London is actually one of the two or three places in the world where very high rolling gamblers 
go to lose large amounts of money. It's one of the places where uh, the kind of people who will lose a quarter of a million dollars in an evening's gambling and not really notice it, you know, will go routinely to do that sort of thing. And there are in Mayfair in London half a dozen clubs. Uh, they are the most opulent establishments you can imagine where that kind of activity takes place. And for rather curious reasons, I spent an evening in which from dusk to dawn I visited all the six casinos that fell into this particular category. It was an interesting evening in a lot of ways. But the aspect of it that most surprised me was that I had expected it to be a kind of fun atmosphere and fun environment. I thought I would be encountering the kind of people who could lose you know, a quarter of a million pounds, could spend a quarter of a million pounds in a good night out and not really be bothered about it. But they weren't actually, in the main, having a good time. They were sitting there looking at the roulette wheel spinning or looking at the cards falling, white knuckled, grim faced, worrying about how the ball was moving or how the cards would fall. <coughs> Now, the people who lose that kind of money, the people who have that kind of money to lose, are typically rather successful entrepreneurial businessmen. And I went away from that evening thinking, how could it be that a lot of people who've made a lot of money successfully in business can sit there, not just once, but evening after evening, believing that they're going to win at roulette, and continue to have that belief, despite the ongoing evidence that they don't. <laughs> After a bit, I started to formulate the explanation and the answer, which is there are a lot of people, I'm sure you know some of them around in the world, who are irrationally optimistic in their behavior towards risk. And these people are disproportionately represented among the ranks of people who are successful in business. There are a lot of people who are not very different from the kind of people I saw in Aspinall's or the Clermont Club, who may not be much less talented, but have certainly been a lot less lucky than the people who were there. But these are not the people you see gambling their, uh, their tens of mil millions of dollars away. The people you see there are people who are drawn from the upper tail of the distribution. These are people who have taken big risks in their lifetime, and they're people for whom these risks would not uh, uh, have actually come off. So you and I, who would not behave with this kind of irrationality, uh, would not take these kind of risks. And that's why you and I are typically not the kind of people who, however successful we may be in our careers, actually have, you know, billions of dollars to throw away in these kind of foolish activities. This is actually something that has been happening, you know, since the very beginning of time. We found dice which are around the campfires of our ancient ancestors where what happened was the irrational optimists, who were the most successful hunters, you know, came back and lost part of their winnings to the more careful analytic spirits in the group, like you and me. And that's why you and I are not people who have tens of billions of dollars to spend in this kind of activity. But you can see that one puts these things together and understands better how it is both that risk markets work and how it is that the dynamics of a capitalist economy work. Because actually, successful innovation and entrepreneurship in a market economy depends on this constant supply of people who are irrationally optimistic in their attitudes towards risk and the way in which the financial system operates by these mechanisms I've described of selling risks to people who understand them not quite as well as the people who are selling them operates in order to take some of these winnings uh, off the people who benefit from that kind of activity. Aspinall's and the Clermont Club casinos are relatively crude mechanisms of redistribution of that kind. The financial markets are actually full of more sophisticated versions of them. The truth is 
that most of the risks that are, we face in everyday life are not actually risks that people buy and sell in securities markets. If you ask what are the risks that typically concern ordinary people, they're the risks that are to do with marriage and relationship breakdown, they're the, 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 the risks that are to do with serious and chronic illness, they're the risks that are to do with redundancy and unemployment. And insofar as these are dealt with at all in society, they're dealt with by social institutions rather than by markets. The reasons there aren't insurance markets against these sort of things, well, you simply have to think of the, the reason why there isn't a divorce insurance market in order to see why uh, these kind of markets don't exist. This is a rather extreme example of information asymmetry. The people who go along to the broker to take out a divorce insurance policy are not going to be a random selection of happily married couples. <laughs> so, the, so that statistics on divorce and relationship breakdown are not going to be very helpful to the actuaries who would be writing these policies. It's exactly like the wallet auction. There aren't terms on which it would make sense for me to sell divorce insurance to the people who want to buy it. And that's why that kind of policy isn't, isn't anywhere to be found. So, if the story which is in the American business model, if the story which I was telling my classes about how financial markets work isn't the central story of how market economies work, what is it? Well, in the book I talk about the contrast between the two mechanisms, the mechanism within, uh, uh, with, within a planned economy of uh, a single voice versus the mechanism of the market economy, which I call discipline pluralism. Back in 1958, uh, as the Cold War began to thaw a bit after the death of Stalin, Khrushchev went to the United States. And it was a memorable visit in a whole variety of ways. They went to see a supermarket, and they went away believing that the shelves had been specially stocked up for their visit as of course would have been true if the President of the United States had gone to visit a Russian supermarket. But what made the biggest impression on Khrushchev was when he was taken to Iowa and he saw the maize fields stretching over the prairies there in the United States. There was clearly no faking fields of maize that stretched as far away as the eye could see. And the result was that Khrushchev went back to Russia convinced that the future of the Soviet Union and its agriculture depended on maize. Maize was why the United States was so rich. So he began a process of large-scale conversion of the wheat-growing areas of the Soviet Union to maize. The truth is the experiment was not a success. There were quite good reasons why wheat rather than maize had been the traditional crop grown in the Ukraine and other areas. But that wasn't what Khrushchev was told. What Khrushchev was told was that he had been wise in his decisions, as usual, and that the experiment was going well, as all things that Khrushchev recommended uh, uh, did. Uh, one of his acolytes famously said, under socialism, maize can be grown anywhere. <laughs> But of course, maize couldn't be grown anywhere under socialism or under anything else. And actually, the agricultural setback that followed from the, the failed conversion of large sections of Soviet agriculture to maize was a principal reason behind the economic setback, which led to Khrushchev ultimately losing power in 1964. The point I want to make was that the experiment with maize in the Soviet Union was not a foolish experiment. Uh, it was quite sensible to try it out. And if an individual Russian farmer had tried it, he would have discovered it didn't work very well, and, uh, and the experiment would have been dropped. On the other hand, if it had been succeeded, his colleagues would have imitated him. What happened in the Soviet Union, on the other hand, was that the decision was made and implemented on an enormous scale and then there was no honest feedback about the process of the experiment. It's a single voice 
which makes decisions on a large scale and has the kind of sycophantic rather than honest feedback that every, all of us have ever worked in large organizations are familiar with as an endemic problem in their political cultures. It's these things that led to these repeated kind of failures in the Soviet Union. Now the example which I use in the book in order to uh, illustrate the contrast is one which I'm not going to lecture to you about because it's one that you all know better than I do, which is the history of the personal computer industry in the United States. But the point which I do want to emphasize from that history, the central point which we should take out of it, and one which I have no hesitation in coming to Redmond to say, is that the personal computer industry did not evolve in the way it did because of any individual genius who saw at an early stage how this industry would evolve. In fact, um, it evolved as a series of a variety of experiments, the vast majority of which failed even at a technical level, and many of those which were important in, in terms of the technical development of the activity actually turned out to be commercially unsuccessful for people who, in, who, who pioneered them. In my judgment, probably the, large, the company that has made the largest technical contribution to the development of the personal computer industry we have is probably Xerox, who built the first operating machine and who invented the graphical user interface. But actually Xerox made, in the end, nothing from a commercial perspective out of these innovations and these discoveries. The contrast with a single voice is a world of discipline pluralism. And I want to emphasize both the discipline and the pluralism. Pluralism is a situation in which people are free to innovate with lots of small scale experiments. And discipline is a world in which unsuccessful experiment is chopped off and successful experiment is quite rapidly imitated. And it's that contrast between the single voice of centralized planning and the disciplined pluralism of a decentralized market economy, which is the essential explanation of why it is uh, you know, that market economies uh, have succeeded and planned economies fail. I won't, I'm exhausting my time, so I won't take, go through the last set of slides which are designed to tease American audiences with the story of how France is in many ways a more successful economy than the United States. I will pass over that. <laughs> Though if people want to raise it in questions, I'll be delighted to I'll be delighted to give you some responses. And simply take you to a French market. Part of my reason for doing both the comparison and for showing you this picture is that I now spend kind of half my life living in the south of France, and I can promise you it's not too bad. <laughs> and it's an environment in which markets function by virtue of their social context. The reason market economies are successful, and the reason it's so difficult for us to find simple descriptions of how market economies function, that people in Russia, in Iraq, or in other underdeveloped countries could adopt and move rapidly ahead from here, is that the market economies we have in the United States, in Europe, and in the few other rich societies of the world, that these market economies are embedded in a social, political, cultural, and technological context. What we've seen in Europe and the United States has been essentially two centuries of co-evolution of these social and political institutions with economic and market institutions, and these, this co-evolution itself being integrated with the development of the kind of technologies whose application has made us all rich. The story which is in my, in my book is a story of the embedded market. It's of the ways in which the wallet auction explains why markets characterized by information asymmetry do not work, 
but the ways in which the market has developed institutions of brands, reputations, and trust relationships that enable us to deal with confidence even in situations where we're confronted by this asymmetric information. Markets then are not a story of encouraging people to be as greedy as possible and imposing very few restrictions on what it is they do. That is what has happened in Russia with rather limited success. That is what happens today in some countries of the world like Nigeria and Haiti and far from being the explanation of why they're rich, it's the explanation of why they're poor. Markets function by virtue of being embedded within a social and political context. Modern prosperity, in short, is the product of a co-evolution of institutions, technology, politics, and society. That's why simple attempts at imitation fail, and why the success of market institutions is directly related to our common experience of the co-evolution of institutions, technology, and society. You may have seen in the slides the presentation with which I began this talk my favorite slogan from the anti-capitalist demonstrators, which was one we took in London and showed a group of protesters carrying a banner that said capitalism should be replaced by something nicer. I don't know any slogan that encapsulates more clearly the basic incoherence of these modern anti-market protesters. But what I want to suggest to you is that that thing nicer with which capitalism might be replaced is actually a better description of how capitalism itself functions. I think in the last 15 years we've done a lot of damage to the cause of market economy by giving people a description of how it is that market economies function, which succeeds simultaneously in being both repellent and false. What I try to do in this book is to give a more nuanced account. Thank you very much. So why is France more productive than the US? <laughs> I think the uh, right, 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 the two questions. One, right, I suspect both of which are, are in your mind. One is, is it? Do you regret to cut in the working day now? I haven't studied so There is some regrets about cutting the working day. But actually, well, let's go back and have a look. And this is a rather extraordinary story, and, it, well, and it's one that tells us quite a lot about the differences between European and US growth rates over the last 20 years. Um, I'll give you the slide that uh, I will probably shock you, which I think is, the, which is that one, which is productivity in terms of output per hour in three countries. Uh, UK, US, and, uh, and France. And you can see what happens in terms of output per hour worked. You know that France starts off in parallel with the UK and well behind the United States. The gap between the UK and the United States remains pretty constant. But in terms of output per hour, France is now actually ahead, not only of, of the UK, but actually of the United States overall. The hours work a person in employment story is quite a large part of the story. What you can see is the steady reduction in working hours which has happened in the last 20 years in most European countries. And the contrast with what has happened in the United States. It's quite difficult to make these comparisons and one shouldn't ma make too much of as it were the levels, but there's, the, the, there's a lot more confidence about the trends you know, that that slide shows. And that the US, which started off the period you know, with the longest working hours uh, right, of any major country in the developed world, over the last 20 years, average hours worked in the United States you know, have gone up slightly, whereas, um, uh, whereas in 
in all, right, in most of the European countries, they've gone down. And in the majority of European countries, they've gone down rather a lot. You'll see that the reduction in France is particularly large. Uh, and one of you mentioned the 35-hour week, which was introduced in France by the socialist government in 1997. But the truth is the 35-hour week is quite a small part of the story. It's simply another blip up in what was already, you know, quite a marked downward trend uh, in working hours in the French economy. So that at its simplest, you know, the largest part of the, right, right, the two parts of the reason why per capita income is higher in the United States than in France, one of which can be summarized as the French typically have five weeks a year holiday and lunch. <laughs> Right, right, and the other of which is that the French retire from the labor force much earlier than, than Americans do. You know, one American man in two between 60 and 64 is still in full-time employment. Only one Frenchman in six in that age group is still working. Astonishingly for a European, you know, one man in, one American in six between the ages of 70 and 74 is still working. The only Frenchman I know of that age group is still working is President Chirac. <laughs> and the main reason he's there is that if he moved out of the Elysee Palace, it's very likely it would be to prison. You know, following the inquiries into his corrupt tenure of, uh, as mayor of Paris, which he's exempt from prosecution for as so long as he remains president of the Republic. France isn't entirely happy. You'll probably know that the left slogan in the last presidential campaign after Jospin, the socialist candidate, was knocked out in the first round was vote for the crew, not the fascists. <laughs> Even the slightly unenviable choices which you face in the United States in these elections seem to be rather better than that. <laughs> Actually, of course, is, is the high productivity, high productivity in part makes it possible for French people to afford to retire from work relatively early and to work shorter hours. It seems to be very likely, actually, that that is also part of the explanation of the higher productivity. That is a lot of people, of the people who are not working in France, but are working in the United States, are people whose productivity, if they were in work, you know, would not actually be be particularly high. The real point of all of this is to say that there are not very large differences in output and productivity between, right, between Europe and the United States. For me, the overwhelmingly strong story is the one of large differences between the 20 rich countries of the world and the rest, and differences between, among, as it were, the rich 20 are relatively finely nuanced. So, um, you suggested that part of the problem of capitalism is the information asymmetry. And you think that if we could solve this problem, that it would be a better system for most of the world? Or do you think that the other issues you may not have mentioned that prevents it from being something quite new? And this is uh, right, what I described as the information asymmetry problem. Um, and it seems to me, and it's always been true. You know, even back in the 19th century, uh, you bought as a right, people would go to buy butter and meat from the grocer and the butcher. And obviously the, but the butcher and the grocer always knew more about the stuff and its provenance than the people who were buying it. And market economies worked by virtue of people developing trust relationships with the people from whom they bought regularly. Now, these kind of mechanisms have been superseded by, you know, the growth of chain retailing and the like. But what that means is we now largely rely on the retailer's brand, you know, or some other mechanism in order to ensure information asymmetry. So in a lot of, in the kind of economics that tends to get taught in Economics 101, people talk about information asymmetry as a market failure. But what it is, is actually it's a failure of a very simple description of how it is a market economy works. It's a failure of the model rather than of the market. 
And the striking thing about the market is the way in which it's developed a whole variety of mechanisms for dealing with these information asymmetry problems. So back to my overriding theme that what we need is a more elaborate and richer model as a description of how it is that market economies really function. <laughs> At the beginning of the study in Germany, I wonder if you also looked at Korea and China where similar experiments happened. And they started, the, the rich part, the capitalist part, started without any democracy. In, in yeah, I mean, there are two, the, the two parts of that story. One is that Korea is kind of another experiment. But the truth is, the, the North Korea Korean regime is so as it were, pathologically deranged, you know, that it's hardly a fair trial of central planning. You know, central planning ought to be able to do better, you know, than it does in North Korea. And indeed, it did do better in East Germany. The striking thing about East Germany was the people who ran that system. You know, we're not a million miles different from the people who were running large corporations in, in Western Germany. You know, it was almost an accident you know, which part of the, uh, of the country they ended up with. That's why it's such a forceful demonstration, uh, you know, of the, of the power of systems. But the second I implicit question in uh, part of your question is the connection between democracy and, uh, and the market economy. And one has to observe there are basically no examples among my 20 to 25 rich countries of countries that have been undemocratic for other than short periods. Probably the most striking exception, but it's a rather peculiar exception, would be Singapore to that particular rule. And it's small and has sort of very peculiar kind of, uh, right, of authoritarian society. It isn't... For me, there isn't a natural, obvious connection between democracy and a successful market economy. But if you attach the emphasis which I do to pluralism, it's actually very difficult to have a society <coughs> that is pluralist in economic terms without also being pluralist in economic and political terms. Now, actually, the Asian economies we're talking about have overcome some of that by being very open to new ideas from outside so that even if, even if they aren't terribly pluralist internally they're operating within, within a pluralist environment. Uh, but I think there is a connection you know, but it's, a, but it's a pretty loose connection. And one of the things I do in the book is to take, is to take a whole variety of variables and look at the correlation between rich societies and the level of these variables. So I talk not just about democracy, but about gender equality, about height, and about religion, you know, all of which turn out to be correlated with, uh, you know, with economic success. Plurality, what you're saying? The, the fact that, that an attempt would, would fail and fairly quickly, and that a good attempt would succeed and would be copied, why doesn't that work in poor societies? See, I, I'm, I'm not sure I see the connection between why the cultural things would have an impact. That mechanism could work, but it requires a whole variety of, as it were, other social institutions in order to make it work as well. And that's essentially the explanation of why in relatively sophisticated societies, you know, planning has worked worse than, than market organization. Um, poor countries, a lot of them have a lot of pluralism. Most of them have rather undisciplined pluralism, you know, and that's quite important. What, one thing that is centrally important is what I call disinterested government. That is a society in which government is basically seen as a means to making yourself and your friends rich. You know, is an almost complete no-no. You, you know, as far as economic development is concerned. You know, for two interacting reasons. You know, one is that that's the way to become rich. You know, that's what entrepreneurial people do. They go into, into as it were, politics rather than business. Uh, you know, and the other is that it means that people who are genuinely successful or hope to be genuinely successful in developing businesses don't have any confidence, 
that they will retain either con the control or the returns from that. As we all know, maintaining disciplined pluralism, maintaining disinterested government is hard work. It's hard work even in our you know, successful democratic societies. The recent election results in India where the incumbent government was pro reform, functioning democracy. We've had a woman leader in the past, several of the points that you just spoke about, but you know, they were thrown out in favor of a more um, of a government that's not so open about reform. Uh, what are your comments on that? I mean people don't like a market economy very much. And part of the reason they don't like a market economy, you know, as I was describing, is that the description of the market economy which has been given to people, you know, that it's about unrestrained, unre unregulated greed, is not a very appetizing description of the market economy. One of my aspirations, uh, you know, is to give people a better description of a market economy that will mean that the, the term market is not a mar as much an anathema to what it is not only to a lot of people in India, but to a lot of intellectual people in the continent from which I come. Uh, one of the depressing things I encountered in Europe, particularly in giving talks on this kind of subject to a variety of audiences, was there was often a question at the end, you know, but which side are you on? Are you for markets or against them? You know, and eventually the kind of answer to that question I came up with was to say, well, look, if I'd come here to give a lecture on quantum mechanics or the Civil War, you wouldn't ask the question, well, was I for it or against it? You know, can't, can't we start by just trying to understand it a bit better? And then we can go on and take our views on it from there. But I'm wondering, in terms of uh, have and have nots, if there are significant differences between those countries and how you want to help those? Um, right, there, there are differences. And not huge differences, but there are differences in the degree of inequality um, amongst these 20 countries. And you won't be surprised that, in, measured in terms of inequality, the United States is pretty close to the top or the bottom, depending on, uh, on which way you look at it. Although it's also striking that the distribution of income in rich countries is almost always, is generally more equal than the distribution of income in poorer countries. <laughs> now, part of, right, part of what is going on here, actually, and, the right, and one of the questions which talking about this around the United States, uh, people always come with a question in the end about what about outsourcing or globalization and something of that kind. And one of the things we need to say is that globalization and the development of wider markets actually makes both rich and poor countries better off taken as a whole, but globalization is very often bad news for poor people with, within rich countries, because what globalization does for successful people in rich countries is it gives them even wider markets in which they can deploy their skills. You know, that's a very obvious point to make in Seattle, you know, where companies like Microsoft and Boeing you know, have done exactly that and the people who work for these companies are huge beneficiaries of globalization. But the contrast is that people in rich countries who really have no skills that people in poor countries don't also have, find their domestic wages being bid down by competition from, from poorer countries. And that's something which has been reflected in the United States in, in the growth of inequality over the last 20 years and in Europe rather more because we have a, a higher level of social provision for poorer people in Europe rather more by, by growing unemployment The people in these categories are simply priced out of jobs and actually if you go back to my working hours slide it's partly that these phenomena which are at work there one of the reasons average working hours in the US have gone up is that the incomes of the kind of people in the US for whom working hours are easily measured and critical, you know, have not gone up, you know, very much. It's a reflection of this inequality in the United States. Um, 
you know, while unemployment has for these reasons, you know, risen in France and other European countries. You know, a lot of unemployment in Europe consists of people aged over 50 who have lost jobs. They, they may be technically unemployed or they may be categorized as sick as disabled, but whatever they are, they're probably not going to work ever again. Yes, I think you can. And uh, one of the important things might be picked out of what I've had to say is in contrasting discipline pluralism with a single voice, it's not simply a contrast between socialism and capitalism, it's a contrast between large centralized you know, organizations and discipline pluralism either between competing organizations or within or larger organizations that are structured so as to encourage it. Let me take two more questions, perhaps. I think that election was more, I mean, it was economic and political, right? You had a lot of people that were very poor voting for a change. And Suicide and just not being able to compete right with an open market. Um, secondly, with China, I just want your assessment on um, the way that it's growing so rapidly and the scare of consumption. And if, if China keeps on growing at eight, nine percent GDP per year, will we have a scare in terms of consumption levels? And, and, and <laughs> uh, I mean, first, why is China growing? And in the book, I say one of the great puzzles of economic history is why the economic development we've experienced recently happened uh, in Western Europe rather than in Southeast China. Because if you look two centuries ago, so many of the kind of objective resource and technological conditions appeared to be similar between the two continents. So in some sense, you know, the puzzle of China is not why China is growing rapidly now, but why the Chinese economy performed so poorly for so long. And that's an observation which is reinforced when you see how economically successful Chinese people have been outside China. You know, whether it's in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, or whether it's as immigrants to, to Britain and the United States. One. Uh, uh, regarding the, the description of the financial markets, the security markets, uh, it seems to me that, that your uh, uh, take on them is characterized largely by kind of anomalous sort of uh, uh, examples of them than, than, than by the sort of normal functioning. If you take Lloyd's uh, scandal and, and the, the, the recent tech bubble, it certainly does look like a lot of foolish people walked in and uh, you've got their, their, their fingers burned. And I imagine that happens quite a lot, but I would assume that, that uh, typical financial and security markets uh, in their normal functioning are more like the markets that, I mean, I, I would most likely get my fingers burned if I went to that French um, uh, vegetable market that you uh, uh, showed uh, in the, on the, in the slide as well. But uh, I would, most, most people there know a lot more about what's going on in that market when they shop there regularly than, than I would. And I would assume that most uh, financial securities markets work that way as well. Is it not the case that the large players in those markets tend to be uh, much more informed and, and, and uh, get ripped off a lot less? Um, I mean, yes, they do. But and let me make two points. Right, 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 one is to say that um, I regard, right, I, I've taken extreme examples in my talk to illustrate, to as it were, caricature uh, points that I believe have more general application. But these obviously are, you know, rather extreme instances. And I'm using these extreme examples to illustrate the point. Uh, I mean, the other is to say, and perhaps this is a good moment on which to end up, I think you probably would get at least slightly ripped off you know, if you went into that French market to buy goods. And you would get slightly ripped off because you are not part of, as it were, the society and culture 
within that or within which that market takes place. And that is really the general theme of my talk, you know, that markets operate by virtue of being part of a, a social, political, cultural context. And without that, you know, markets themselves do not operate efficiently. And that is why there is no simple manual as to how it is you do it. Thanks. Thank you.